Well, it says you're zero percent racist. I'm not racist. From conducting one of the largest nationwide surveys, get off here. To having difficult conversations. So they make racist jokes about you. Yeah, definitely. Our harmony so far has been easy harmony. We don't really want to talk about it. What do you think the current status is for racial harmony? It's kind of superficial. Does that mean there is something else beneath the surface? Brewing tensions, suppressed racism, anxiety about our peace and progress. If there is, that could be a major problem. That was in 2016. At the time, it was considered groundbreaking because having such conversations, especially on national TV, was practically unheard of. Five years later, the conversation is loud, and we are calling out these incidents, we're calling out racism, we're not shying away from it. And today, I have here my guests, we're going to revisit this divisive issue in a special discussion to see if we can ever become regardless of race. I have here some guests from our previous show. Sunny Sarip and Shima were interviewed on our previous documentary. And we have some new guests. Santosh, who works for an AI platform that deals with conversations on race, amongst other things. And Timothy, who runs uh, Unsaid, a platform that uses art to engage with conversations, as well as Leanne, who's commented on issues of race and politics quite often. And joining us virtually, we have Dr. Daniel Goh from the National University of Singapore, as well as Dr. Matthew Matthews from the Institute of policy studies. I'm going to jump right in. You know, Shima, we interviewed you five years ago. Five years on, what's your experience? Has our racial harmony improved, changed in some way? Um, I think it has been the same. Um, these are microaggressions we're talking about. It would take longer than five years. Um, if anything, the only difference is that I've grown more indifferent to these stereotypes or microaggressions. You've grown more indifferent? Yes, Why? as compared to when I did the walk. Why? Um, I suppose when you see that change isn't happening, you would have to do something um, to, uh, with yourself. So uh, you hear these things every day and you feel affected by it. The only way to move forward is just to like, you know what, it's just going to keep happening. So just keep moving forward. Would you have expected change in five years? What's the one thing you would have wanted to change? Uh, I think five years, is, uh, like I said, is too short. Um, at least, um, I guess we did start the conversation, which is a good thing. And now you see that people are talking about it more because of social media. So I guess um, that's the thing that is a positive take from that walk. Maybe I move to Timothy. Timothy, do you think things have changed recently around race and racial harmony? I think we're having more conversations around it. I think people are being more aware about how things are happening. Um, but honestly, it's always been the same. Um, as Shima mentioned, microaggressions have always existed. Um, and, but it, it took a viral video of someone being so violently and explicitly racist for us to start looking inwards. And I think that um, that becomes upsetting. That becomes also like, you know, people have been talking about it. Why, does, why, why do we need something so violent to validate minority voices and all this kind of stuff? Santosh, you... you do you think uh, the minority voice hasn't been validated? Do you feel the same way? Yes, I feel the same way. I feel like I'm suppressed and repressed. And just in the recent months, there is an increased state of anxiety and stress within my system. When I go out of my house, I am in a state of hypervigilance and alert because of the stories that I'm hearing from my other minority friends. There are Indians who go on the MRT train, they take a seat and then members of the other race just stand up and go away, move away. I have friends who have been denied the opportunity to rent a place because the landlord thinks that they're going to cook curry in the home and it's going to smell the entire place. So hearing stories of microaggressions and even macroaggressions has just created this sense of anxiety and it's actually triggered the trauma that was already existent for so many years. 
So th this is the, the kind of experience that you guys are growing through uh, sort of as individuals and perceiving what's going on. But sometimes useful to have a look at some data. And I'm going to just bring up two points of data. And Dr. Matthew Matthews was involved in the first study, which is from the Institute of Policy Studies. And it, in a survey, asked residents whether they had racist behavior more frequently or less frequency. And what we saw was a reduction in the number of I respondents reporting that there was no racist incidents from 79.2 in 2012 to 65.7 in 2020. There's another point of data that I'm going to just show you, and these are reports to the authorities of racist incidents uh, rising from 2018 uh, or at 18 all the way to 60 in 2020. Maybe I might turn to Dr. Matthews. Um, what's your sense? The data and the uh, lived reality that our three friends have described suggests that things are getting worse. Would you agree? You know, we have always had to contend with racism, uh, and that's been uh, historical. Uh, but I think what is clearer, if you look at the data, at least the, the data from the World Value Survey we, we put out recently, it's very clear that I mean, there are a few groups which are more aware about racism. Uh, those who are younger, uh, minorities, those who are better educated. And among uh, those groups, they're a lot more attuned to the fact that racism is an issue. Uh, they probably have heard it, uh, paid attention to the news, uh, become a lot more familiar with all the different discussions that have been maybe the show a few years ago, many of the other reports. And I think this has helped them to better appreciate the fact that racism is around. And so when they see something which, you know, maybe previously uh, something would have been dismissed as uh, not being racist, but today maybe people look at it and say, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be something so in your face to be categorized racism, something which is casual but actually does hurt. Individuals can also be racism. So I think people are more willing to talk about it and look at things and say, that's racism. Let me turn to Dr. Daniel Goh. Daniel, uh, I'm, I've got this sense from a larger narrative, lots of commentary that overall our racial harmony has made tremendous progress. But in recent days, lots of incidents on social media and the experience that we've talked about here today, as well as we've got data to suggest that things may be getting worse. So what's your sense? Getting better? Getting worse? Or is that too simple a way to look at it? Yeah, I, I think it's same, same, but different. You know, um, it's, What's happening is, is that racism is endemic. Yeah, there's casual racism, microaggressions has been, you know, with, with, with us, you know, um, since um, 1965. So I don't think that's any different, but awareness is one thing, increased awareness, increased consciousness. But I think also in the last one year, uh, the pandemic has, has made some uh, impact on our consciousness. Uh, and one thing is that we are more reliant now uh, on social media as, as our reality because we are cut off from physical realities. Uh, and that, I think, has also increased a lot of sharing, a lot more connections. And you see that people are sharing more openly uh, about their experiences. Uh, so we have an uh, increased uh, amount of stories and, and you know, um, um, narratives that, that, that they're going on uh, telling us about these incidents of racism. So I'm going to sort of summarize the views that I've heard so far. Leanne, would maybe you ask, I'm going to ask you, do you agree or don't you agree? The stuff's been there all along, but now because we're calling it out, we're just much more aware of it. Yes, I do agree with that. To continue with what Dr. Daniel Goh mentioned, so there's a few Instagram uh, groups like uh, Minority Voices and Wake Up Singapore and people, my friends, you know, Malay and Indian friends have been sharing their childhood experiences or working experiences of being discriminated against. Um, yeah, and definitely, you know, people are jumping into the comments and sharing what they felt but were too scared to, to voice out, you know, in fear of offending other people. And I feel that um, because of the pressures of the pandemic and, you know, the influx of foreign workers and expats and just this whole international mix, there's a whole new layer of complexity in, in racism. Mm. Yeah. So what you're saying also makes me think of the discussions I've had with Sunny. I mean, Sunny, you, you've had this to struggle with this, right? Do you call out or don't you call out? Yes. You, you had a post five years ago yes. that went viral. You encountered racism in a, sing in a cinema when uh, you had a young Chinese boy say he didn't want to sit beside Malay people. And then we had an interview with you on the show. This was our interview. On the day this happened, you didn't say anything to the boy? I just wanted to just 
tell him off straight then and there. You know, it's like, you, if you cannot sit beside me, you get out of here. Do you think we find it difficult to talk about race and problems with race? Yes, it is very difficult to talk about this. Sunny, yes. that was five years ago. Yes. Five years ago, we had some difficulty getting you to come on the show. You took a bit of persuasion. <laughs> yes. But this time round, uh, you were quite enthusiastic. You were quite willing to come and talk to us today. Uh, yes. What's changed? I suppose now I feel a bit more comfortable speaking up against um, instances of racism, like be it microaggressions or overt or covert um, racism. What's led to that comfort to call it out? Uh, personally, I feel that it's better to just speak up and make it known that you, you know, make it known, let them know that, hey, I'm uncomfortable with you saying these things about me. Give me an example. Have something happened recently? Uh, yes. I was working with this company, okay, and, you know, we had a work-related spat, but, I mean, being working colleagues, that's fine. It happens all the time. So I just left it at that. Then he came in, okay, then he had to have the last word and said, by Indian. Okay, like, I would have reacted the same way if he said by Malay or by Chinese. So it's not about being Indian or whatever. <coughs> so I just like called him out, but he blocked me. So I just told his boss, I mean, I just sent an email to his company. Turns out he is the owner of the company. So in my mind, it's like, okay, never mind. I have, <coughs> I have said what I needed to say. You know, I hope he understands. I hope he knows that. I hope he knows that what he did was wrong, and I hope he can reflect on it. So you were hurt by this. I was absolutely hurt. I was very, very upset. Uh, but the you reacted to that hurt by by doing something. I reacted to the hurt by one making. Oh no! Uh, I informed the I informed the people I was working with. Mm -hmm. Say I don't want to work with these kind of people. I will never ever work with these kind of people. And two, I demand an apology, but an apology never came. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Never mind. Okay. And then after that, I received spam emails from certain organisations which pertain to a particular race. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like, okay, I just let it be, and you're still attacking me. Okay. Let me just ask for the for, for opinions from the rest of you. Mm. Uh, I mean, would you have reacted the same way to this type of incident? Uh, you know, someone sort of dismissing you and on the basis of your race. Santosh? I think uh, from a trauma point of view, I have feelings which are very frozen deep down within me, and such triggers actually create a, recreate the trauma that once existed within my body, and I'm usually in a state of denial or shock, and I fear confrontation. Yeah, but with people whom I can trust, I think Therein lies a safe space for us to have an open conversation and to reconcile the differences that we have. But if it's a stranger, then I would probably just ignore because I feel triggered and I'm not in a great or healthy state of mind to deal with this. Yeah. Maybe, uh, Daniel, can I turn to you? I mean, what we're talking about here, the, the sort of example that Sunny brought up and the reaction that Santosh is talking about, uh, it leads people to call things out. But what we call out and how we call it out uh, is also important, right? I mean, um, is, yes. is there a way of going too far? Uh, what do you have to say about when and how to call these things out? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, you, know, you, you, can't, you can't respond uh, uh, with the same kind of uh, racism. I mean, that's, that's the key thing, right? So I think what Sunny did was, 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 um, was, very, cali was very calibrated. Uh, you know, he was aiming at trying to get to the understanding of the other party, uh, that you know, his actions were deeply hurting uh, and deeply hurtful and, and was racist. Uh, but he didn't get the response. And I think that kind of frustration, you know, I, I can feel it from, from what he just shared, uh, is, is something that you know, it, it puts him down on dead end. Right? So what is he going to do? Is he going to post on social media in order to get the attention, uh, to you know, get the frustration out? Um, I, I think that is, a, that, that is a real issue. Yeah. It's a very real issue. Yeah. One, one of the very memorable things about these real issues and bringing them up um, I think came up in our 2016 documentary, which is The Privilege Walk. And I, Shima, mm. you, you remember this. We, we had this ex social experiment. It was the first time it was done on national television. You, you were in that experiment. Yeah. Maybe we'll take a quick look at what we did on the show. You've done something well, and you've been congratulated because you're a credit to your race. Take a step back if this has happened to you. 
Someone's made fun of you at school because of the colour of your skin. Step back. This is your final position. Those in front enjoy more societal privileges than those standing at the back. I ended up being the last one and it feels weird. It's actually quite surprising. I would think that someone who is of a more minority than I am, like the Indian lady, would be behind me. Shima, would you have the same experience if we did the experiment today? Uh, I think so, yes. So, like I said previously, the microaggressions, right? Um, I still hear them. I still experience them. It's more of um, how I want to react to them. So I still experience people telling me that, oh, Malays cannot do math, but I actually love math, yes. But is that privilege or is that just bias? I mean, we call it the privilege walk. Would you say that there is an issue of privilege? Um, I would say privilege, it's privilege because it comes from the fact that um, it's a dominant race, right? So then because it's more, more people can get to experience it, that's why it's privilege. And so, yeah, so this idea that it's harder to be a minority, I mean, yes. we had some discussion about that. Maybe I'll turn to Daniel again. Uh, you know, this idea of privilege, whether it's just simply the fact that we have it more difficult if you're in the minority and easier in the majority, or this term of Chinese privilege. And you had some comments about how we should be thinking about this idea of privilege. Yeah, because the term is, is very much a borrowed from America uh, and a kind of mimicry of white privilege. Uh, so it's not adapted to the situation and the context here. Uh, so it's used as a shortcut, and as a shortcut, it might be useful in certain circumstances. Uh, but generally, I mean, if you apply it and weaponize it as a, as a, as a, as a thing to, to, you know, to, to throw it back at the aggressors or, or, to, or to use it as a blanket term, you know, it's, it's going to cut off conversations. I mean, that's, that's the problem with it. Yeah. <clears throat> Matthew, maybe I'll turn to you. Uh, what, what, how, what's your sense? you agree with this framing of the idea of privilege? You know, I think we have to accept the fact that there is some kind of privilege that if you're part of the majority, then certainly there's some things that make it a little easier for you. Uh, and, and I think there needs to be an acceptance that sometimes minorities have it a little harder, whether it's about getting a job, whether it's about having to deal with some of the insults and statements. But then, at the same time, I think we have to be careful about how we label that uh, to, to throw that term, uh, Chinese privilege, very easily. I think that's have a way of... Uh, stopping conversations. It does uh, put it as if like the one particular race, the dominant race, the Chinese, are the source of all uh, the problems and, and that should not be the case. I don't think that framing helps. Maybe I can turn to Timothy and then <coughs> Leanne quickly. Uh, so the, the other side of this is that the majority maybe needs to take a little bit of extra effort and that's been brought up in several commentary. But at which point does that extra effort become almost condescending? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not having it, it's, it effect or having an effect of making things worse? I think number one, you've got to really decide what you're really trying to do. I mean, I believe that majority privilege, privilege exists. I mean, that's why we call it Chinese privilege with more than 70% of the population being Chinese. But I think this is what privilege everyone holds is as such a burden and guilt and all that also. So what, so okay, we have, I'm a Chinese man, so what do I do? Offer allyship. There are multiple places out there. Validate your friends' voices. Each time you hear someone else saying that, hey, this story is not true, or they, they've got mental health issues and whatnot also, be like, no, this is his lived experience, his or their lived experience, and what they do with it also. I mean, these stories come from a place of truth and a place of past traumas as well. And I think it is... Firstly, our responsibility to educate yourself. Okay. There are resources out there and also listen to the stories. Leanne, maybe I can turn yes. to you. If it's not an issue of Chinese privilege, how do we think about this? Actually, I do agree with the term Chinese privilege, but I can see why some people might, might feel defensive about it because they don't want to be seen as a bad person. But what a Chinese person can do is to stand up for a friend, for example. Um, but I do agree with what Dr. Daniel Goh said, which is you have to be careful with what you say because it closes off conversation. So, for example, if someone said, um, you know, my Indian friend shared on my Minority Voices that a taxi driver said, you're pretty for an Indian. And a Chinese commenter is like, oh, she's just bragging that she's pretty and fair skin. And it took me to kind of explain it to her and give her the benefit of the doubt and be gentle in, in the way I explain instead of just throwing accusations. But that's it. I feel that other than these microaggressions, bigger issues like housing, 
uh, discrimination against Indian renters and discrimination in jobs, even like giving tuition and not wanting an Indian person to teach their kids. Yeah. It's very widespread. So we do what we can in sharing stories and humanizing people because after all, we have Indian and Malay friends. And so, yeah. yeah. So those are some of the things we'll be talking about a little bit later in the program. So where, where does this leave us? You know, the reported incidents of racism appear to be on the rise, but part of that may well be because we're more vocal uh, about calling it out. But does that being more vocal make for a more cohesive society? And some of what we've discussed is that we need to then move a little bit beyond calling it out to pulling people along on that journey. When we come back, we'll tackle some of the controversial issues of race-based policies after the break. Welcome back to this frank discussion on race and racism in Singapore. For this segment, we're also joined by Dr. Nazri Barawi from the Singapore Institute, uh, Singapore University for Technology and Design. We still have Dr. Daniel Goh, Timothy Seat, Santosh Kumar, Shima, Sunny, and Leanne from the first segment. I'm going to just jump straight into this issue that almost defines how we think of race-based policies, which is our racial, racial categorization process. The, what the talk about the CMIO framework. Sunny, you have strong views on this. Uh, yes, um, um, regarding CMIO, for language-based policies, I, it's okay because we need our languages. We need our Chinese, we need our Malay, you know, Tamil and other languages. But um, about EIP, I feel like it's, mm, it's okay, but it can be improved further because it's, how say, it's, it's very hard for, it's, I don't know how to say it. Uh, but, but it sounds yeah. like you, you don't disagree with the need for race-based policies. It's I just how it is applied. Yes, I do not disagree with it. I just, I just feel that like it could be applied better. I see. Mm. I see. Do, are there views? Do you think that we need to continue to have a CMIO race-based categorization framework, Shima? I, I think we do need it because um, you, so that we can classify each other. And Why? Because then you can meet the different needs. Because if we just have one race and then all the more there's room to misunderstand so the classification is actually for us to understand better. Hmm. Timothy, maybe I, I could turn to you. Do you have the same views that the CMI framework is, <coughs> is, is needed? I think that, for me, I think on top, uh, as for, it stretches all the way until data collection, understanding the different cultures, the different ethnic groups, even within the races. I think with the CMIO model, it's a little bit too simplistic at this stage. And I think moving to race-based policies also, I guess, the question now is, that do we need it right now as well? I think when it first came out, it was because um, we were racially so segregated. But as we evolve, as society evolves, as all these trends evolve also, where do we, where do we see it in our current society? Does it really reduce um, people who could really stay there also? Or does it, um, or is it just, you know, using like different, using racial identifiers to really force this kind of harmony in also? Mm. Like, can we find a way where Sure, we're not trying to be monoracial in one building and things like that, but can we find a more better and evolved way into looking at Could it? Could I just jump in there? Leanne, go ahead, yes. Um, I feel that, yes, as Sunny said, CMIO is important regarding cultural things, but one area where CMIO might not be the most meaningful marker would be in terms of income level. So there are organisations that help the lower income Chinese, Malay and Indians, um, but then... I've read certain opinions and people, you know, Malay friends and scholars who say that it's not helpful to characterize a certain race as being more low income. Mm. It would be more helpful to say these are the group of low income people where a certain race is overrepresented mm. rather than linking race to a certain uh, condition. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I can turn to Dr. Nazri. I mean, the intent with the I think the welfare is certainly not to link race and income, but uh, I think the larger issue is what do people feel about our CMIO framework? And there are some groups which say that we need to do away with it, that we're already a post-race-based society. We've heard from some examples of why there might be a need for us to continue to have a CMIO framework and possibly even improve upon it in some way or adjust it in some way. You have views on this? 
Yes, uh, I do. Thanks for uh, asking me that question. And I think some of the answers that I want to say have already been said by uh, some of the participants. But I think my primary reservation with the CMIO model is the fact that it uh, takes uh, race as the primary identity marker. And that uh, even if we accept that to be true, uh, we are ignoring, maybe flattening even the super diversity within each uh, major category that we're using, such as in, in within the Malay community, you have uh, other groups such as the Javanese, the Boyanese, etc. Et But, same, yep. Dr. Nasri, I'm going to just jump in because it sounds to me like you're asking uh, for two opposite things. You know, one is not to have race as your primary marker, but then at the same time you're asking for a, a more granular look at race <laughs> and a subcategory of race as a primary marker. I mean, so I think on, on, on one hand we have to say, well, if we don't have race-based policies, maybe we don't need the CMO framework. But we do have race-based policies, and for that, don't we need the CMIO framework? Yeah, I'm not try trying to say that the race-based uh, policies are totally useless, uh, but I think there are some use to it. For example, uh, one of the participants said that in terms of culture or things that you can uh, analyze which does not lead to stereotypes, I think that's really good in thinking about, say, language use at home or for something like that. Uh, but in terms of, say, the in ethnic integration policy, we have heard in Parliament recently that there are some material consequences with regards to how the CMIO model has been represented. Now, I'm not saying that e the EIP uh, policy is actually uh, something that is not needed. What I'm trying to say is that could there be other ways that we can think about of trying to avoid ethnic enclaves, which I think is a, a, good, uh, a good way to... to um, it's, a, it's a thing that we should be avoiding. What kind of other ways would you like to suggest? If, if ethnic enclaves are the issue, yep. uh, surely we need to know what ethnicity one is. Right, so uh, what I think we should do is look at the very process of data collection. And I think we need to recognize that people uh, make decisions not just based on their ethnicity, they make their decisions based on income levels, based on where their family stays, based on maybe even educational level, which area they want and stuff like that. So I think a kind of data collection uh, method in which we recognize the complexity of how people make decisions would lead to better suggestions. Right now, I don't have that data and I wouldn't say what my suggestions would be, but I certainly think that go going ahead, we should think about how we do go about doing it. Mm. Daniel, maybe I could turn to you. The EIP has been contentious. Uh, it's been described as one of our most socially intrusive policies. But recently in Parliament, uh, we've had a consensus that we will make it work now and it's needed now. Uh, and we will need it for until we get to a post-race state. Uh, but what's your sense? The CMIO framework serves its needs? Um, definitely. I mean, I think for any government of the day, if a progressive government of the day wants to track progress of its uh, uh, citizens, you have to break down the citizens into different groups which will have inequalities, right? So, I mean, should we do away with gender, for example, uh, male and female? No, because we want to know that, you know, we want gender equality to, to, to be achieved uh, one day. So, same, uh, equality among the races. We want, we want to be able to track the progress. Um, as for EIP, uh, you know, the, the main issue is really a, a, a small market for minority sellers uh, where the EIP quotas uh, kicks in for, for a particular estate or for a particular block. Uh, so we have to go down to that, you know, to that specific uh, issue, uh, not, not, to, not to reform the EIP wholesale, but to just look at the, the, how do we improve uh, the, the, you know, the, the opportunities for the, the minority sellers to, uh, to, to sell the, the, the HDB flat, right? So I think that's, that's the, the most basic issue uh, at hand now. Thanks, Daniel. Maybe mm. I could turn to Santosh. Uh, I, I don't know if you, I, I don't want to presume your age, whether you've bought your first HDB flat or not, but uh, what, what do you think? Do you think that EIP as a way of dealing with this issue of preventing ethnic enclaves is useful, relevant? As with any other tool, uh, the EIP is a double-edged sword. It's beneficial because it encourages intermingling and intermixing of different races. I'm personally a beneficiary of this. I remember when I was in primary school, we used to hang around with kids of other races on the same corridor, on the same floor. I'm a beneficiary of EIP, but where I think Singaporeans disagree based on the data we're receiving on our crowdsourcing platform is the use of race in our identification cards or identification purposes. While we can collect data on race, class, income or gender, we should not be using it to identify people 
on things that are physical on them. No, I understand. But yeah. uh, let's just focus on the EIP first of all, because it is a contentious issue. Um, I think once you say you, you identify someone by race, we can argue where you put that identity marker. I mean, nobody checks my NRIC before coming to the conclusion that I'm Indian, right? But when it comes to buying and selling a house, uh, that's something that affects your whole family. But you think the EIP serves its purpose then to prevent ethnic enclaves? Do you understand why people are concerned about it? I think if you, by a case-by-case -case basis, if there are certain ethnic minorities who are denied of their rights to, let's say, sell their houses because of the quota, the EIP quota, I think then that separate policies could be looked at uh, addressing such needs. Uh, the EIP on its whole, which encourages intermingling and intermixing, could be preserved, but I think we should bear in mind that there are probable, probable side effects that we should be watching out for and address them as they arise. Mm. Does anybody think we can get rid of the EIP? I mean, or, or what would it take for us to, to, to get past this? I, was, I mean, I would just add, like, why don't we extend the whole idea of EIP to, let's say, class integration? Mm -hmm. yeah, the whole yeah. issue of, <coughs> of, of class in Singapore, uh, class divides, is actually more pertinent and more prevalent and something that we should be looking at as seriously as the ethnic integration policy. So why don't we look at class? Because we see class concentration in certain geographical regions of Singapore, which is probably a far bigger problem and far bigger issue than the EIP. Yeah. So I think we should... So yeah. yeah, understood. But, uh, but let's just, <coughs> Leanne, you're about to say something about the yeah. EIP. I would like to just mention that for myself, and I've talked to a few friends to, to ask them what they feel about EIP, is that they actually don't make so many friends of other races. Um, and I think for kids of this generation, even more so, they don't have time to play. They're just like at home and studying and tuition all the time. But a consensus I got was, we start making meaningful friendships with people of other races in secondary schools or polytechnics. This is when, or JC, uni, this is when we understand that, you know, I have a friend and racism is bad. And one more thing that a friend with kids mentioned, she felt that SEP schools, uh, the good schools, uh, which are usually Chinese schools, kind of reinforce this Chineseness, you know, and you know this division between more talented and less talented students. Yeah. And yeah, well, so I mean, I think there the are EIP in homes might not be as useful as in classes. Mm in education and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that the issues do come together because you know, we do build HDB towns with a wide variety of housing types, precisely so that Singaporeans of different types from different backgrounds can, can live together. And most Singaporeans go to a preschool and a primary school very close to their HDB town. So in a way, the EIP policy means that those schools are relatively mixed. Uh, there are exceptions across the educational landscape, but in general terms, it means that we have this experience that Santosh talked about, growing up among people of all kinds of races, rather than them having been segregated here and there. So I think, you know, uh, the, the policies that we're talking about, they've been described as dynamic. Uh, we are a dynamic society with these dynamic policies, and they will need to continue to be fine-tuned. And the government has committed to fine-tuning these policies, even as we understand that some of them cause what they call rough edges, and we need to mitigate against those rough edges. But for now, we will need the CMIO framework for as long as we have race-based policies, or until we get to a post-racial state. What is that? It's a term that's been bandied about. We'll discuss that when we come back after the break. Do you talk about other races when you're at home? No. Do your no. parents talk about other races? No. no. What race is your best friend? Indian. Chinese. Chinese. Indian. Indian. So have you heard people say things about your race? Yes. It's usually said by Indians and, uh, and Malays. They say that I like, look very pale and then I don't look nice. How about you, Bravi? I'm like, a bit too dark. People say my culture is bad. How do you feel when, they, when you hear them when you say things like this? The good things, I feel like very proud. The bad things, I feel like why, why are we in this culture like that? 
I first met these kids five years ago on Racial Harmony Day. They were nine at the time and already aware of some of the issues of race and racial differences and racial harmony. Well, they're back here with us today. We've got Candice, Zoe and Praveen. We still have Sunny and Shima as well as Dr. Daniel Goh and Dr. Nazri Barawi. So <laughs> let me, let me uh, uh, turn to you, Praveen. You know, you, we ended off the videotape looking at you. Do you face similar incidents still? No, I don't. Because I think over time, race, the racial discriminations have changed from straight up and direct to more of casual racism. So in previously, when I was nine, I faced more direct comments onto my face. But now, I'm um, 14, my friends are 14. They know what to say and what not to say. So I face more of like inside jokes and stuff that others don't think that may hurt my race, but it does hurt me internally, but I don't show them. Give me an example. So once my friend said, uh, why, are, why are Indian people's names so long? Uh, and he said that to an Indian friend with a short name. So, And he's like, oh, Indian people's are named so long and they're very difficult to pronounce. And we just laughed it off, but I thought it was pretty racist. But it has been casualized over time, and now it's casual racism. Uh, I felt really left out at that time because you know, I wanted to like blend in to everyone. But now I felt like I was alone, and my race was left out of the community. Um, so but the I didn't really show it you out. Did Why didn't you show it? I didn't want to seem too sensitive about anything. I just played it off cool. So, so that's a bit of a change. You're, the experiences, the things that you're experiencing is changing, but your, your reaction is changing as well? No, last time I didn't react At that all. much either. Why not? I didn't know how to react. Like, do I scream in front of them or what? So I just keep my thoughts to myself. I don't really express them in any way. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, Zoe and Candice, you, maybe I could turn to you. Have you had similar experiences or heard of similar experiences amongst your friends? So I think like because we are Chinese and like we are the majority, so we don't really like um, face these kind of experiences. But I do feel like we kind of have a privilege in school because, for example, like in a lot of classes, most of like um, the people are Chinese. So there are only like two or three Indians and like a few Malays only. So I feel like because people feel more comfortable interacting with people from the same race. So therefore, for example, like the Indians, if there are like only two of them in like one class, then I feel that they will kind of stick together more only and they feel less comfortable talking to the rest of us. So what's your sense? Do you, do you, are you aware of direct racial um, acts or is it very subtle like what, uh, what Praveen has described? I think it's like very subtle because we live in like a multiracial society so people understand that we have to like respect other races. However, I think like many people still have like some preconceived opinions or like misassumptions about other races but because it's considered like disrespectful so they keep them to themselves. And does that disrespect ever come out? Have you had examples? Mm, I think one example would be like I heard from a friend uh, because like Chinese students, not all of them have like English names. Some of them have Chinese names only. So there was, I heard there was like a teacher because she couldn't um, pronounce the Chinese name of this student. So she the, actually... The, the teacher was not Chinese? Yeah, she was not Chinese. So she actually changed the name to an English name. So like, I think looking back on it, a lot of us just like laughed off it. But... After all, because it's your own name, so it's a bit disrespectful if like someone just comes up with a totally different name for you. What do you think we should be doing in schools then to deal with some of these issues? Zoe? I think that in schools that perhaps we could uh, raise awareness. Although actually I think that most schools are already doing such things since we live in a multiracial society, like say on International Friendship Day or say Racial Harmony Day. But Would you like to see some classes on this? Some formal teaching on the matter? 
Honestly, I think maybe some schools do it. For example, they have classes on other races like my school has. We have like a, ma- a la- Malay class that lets us open our eyes to the Malay culture, like say Ramadan and some basic Malay phrases. But I also think that it may be slightly unnecessary as we live in a meritocratic society and that some most of our students mostly don't pay attention actually if it's not but if it isn't really an examinable subject. I myself am guilty of this sometimes. So <laughs> I think it, uh, it might not work, honestly. But ha- are you aware of initiatives within your schools to try to deal with some of these things? Uh, Candice, do you have any examples? Of yeah, so I think like in my school, there is actually like a student-led group that actually um, focuses on raising awareness about casual racism because of like the recent like cases in Singapore and like worldwide as well. And also, I think my school tries to raise more awareness about the cultures of different races, like. You know, because in school, because Chinese are like the majority, so we only um, like celebrate Chinese New Year. But for like Hari Raya and Deepavali, because um, only the minority celebrate it, so we don't actually have like a formal celebration in school to celebrate it. But then my school tries to like kind of get students to kind of um, form a project where they raise more awareness about Hari Raya, for example. So I think these initiatives are actually very meaningful and effective. Maybe I could turn to our professors, uh, Dr. Daniel Goh and Dr. Nazri Barawi. These students are going to be potentially become your students in a few years' time. Uh, as, as academics and educators, uh, what's your sense? about uh, the, the, the task is often laid at the feet of education to do more, to, to teach our young about race and racism. But we've heard that perhaps if it's not an examinal subject, how far can we go? Uh, there's already a series of efforts, but perhaps if they don't live out racial tensions, it's hard for them to sort of contextualize it. Uh, What's your sense? Should we be doing more, doing less, or doing things differently? Maybe I'll start with Dr. Nazri. What what do you think that we should be doing within the education space, or maybe the efforts should be taken elsewhere? Thanks. uh. So listening to the participants earlier, I think a lot of the efforts in schools have been directed at cultural ideas of how races celebrate certain occasions or festivals and stuff like that. And I think while such efforts should continue, I think uh, uh, some new efforts should, could be done in looking at uh, racism as a systemic issue. And here I think I'm thinking about the idea of anti an anti-racist education, possibly in the primary. I'm, I'm not sure if primary level is too early, but certainly in the primary or secondary or perhaps even the university level and by uh, anti-racist education it, 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 the point is to draw attention to the idea of how systems institutions and how just now we talk about the CMIO model could even lead to certain negative consequences for example if we think about how we uh, look at certain social issues and diagnose them and we, if we see that say drug abuse is very high among Malay users there's a tendency that some people will take this to be that Malay uh, drug abusers and I think that's not not the right thing to do Maybe I could turn to you, Daniel. Uh, you can answer the same question, but I've got an additional question. Uh, you know, you, you deal with these issues, you research these issues, uh, but then in your class, uh, do you, how, are there things that you do to make your class a positive experience for learning about race and racism in Singapore? Well, actually, I like to put my students in an uncomfortable position um, as much as possible by teaching them um, you know, that, that racism still exists and that uh, uh, racial inequalities and, and other inequalities exist and, and they have to face it and, and, uh, and understand where it comes from. Um, and and that, that's the, that, that was the purpose of the privilege walk that you, that you conducted in 2016. Um, but we conduct the privilege walk uh, across all the different you know, uh, uh, demographic kind of characteristics like age, gender, uh, class, and so on and so forth. So it's to get them to understand that all these things interact Right, to, to create a, a privileged kind of complex. Uh, um, but making, coming back to the issue of education, and, and, and we don't just teach them about the awareness about um, these issues, about institutional racism, about casual racism. Uh, we also encourage them to move towards uh, interculturalism. Inter-Asian uh, is, is the word that we like to use a lot, which is to get people to share and understand each other's circumstances and histories and values, and to start creating shared spaces. Um, and, and this was this is really actually built into our DNA as, as a Singaporean, uh, you know, to create a kind of common shared spaces between the races. And this was our founding fathers, uh, you know, kind of dream, right? The Rajaranam uh, notion of you know common spaces uh, and whatnot. Do you think we'll ever get to a post-racial state, Daniel? I, I don't think I want to get to a post-racial state in the sense that we, we do away with race, because I think the the the, the CMIO, Chinese Malay Indian. Um, 
uh, others do not just signify uh, a skin color, if you want to put it that way, as, as a kind of racial characteristics. But I think they indicate and, and actually point us to um, ancient civilizations that we all come from. Uh, Nusantara, Chinese civilization, Indian civilization, Middle Eastern civilizations. So we, we need to keep these uh, cultural bases in you know, our heritage alive, uh, or else we lose all sense of you know, who we are. So I think these are very important, but I think it's important to emphasize that you know, it, it has to be inter-Asian. We, have, we, have we are hybrids of all these different civilizations. Okay, well, I think whether we get to a post-racial state or not, we all want to become more race-blind, right? We, we don't want this disc discrepancy and uh, discrimination to carry on. But maybe I'm going to go around and ask you for one thing, just one, quickly, what is it that you want to take action on or see done uh, in order to get us to this, whether it's post-racial or race-blind state? I'm going to start with Sunny and then I'll go to Praveen and I'll work my way around. Sunny, one thing that you want to see done? Teach our younger generations to be more race-blind. How? By, by not perpetuating stereotypes that certain races are like this, other races are like okay, that. Okay, don't perpetuate stereotypes. Yes. Praveen, what about you? And then I'm going to go to Dr. Nasri for his one action point. Um, I also wanted to talk about the stereotypes, I think. Uh, it's a big thing in racial discrimination, racial stereotypes. So I think we should like work on proving that the stereotypes are incorrect and there are some um, sort of... Um, Positive examples? Yeah, positive examples from that deny the stereotypes. So when the public gets to know all these examples, they may like want to change their vision on a certain race. Okay. Dr. Nasri, one point of action that you'd like to see? Yeah, I would like to see the younger generation teach the older generation more about the idea of anti-racism. Okay, the younger generation teach the older generation. Daniel, one thing that you would like to see as an action point. I would like everyone to listen to everyone more. Um, for the younger generation to listen to the older generation too. Okay. I should maybe talk less and listen more as well. <laughs> All right. And let me listen to you, Shima. What's the one thing that you'd like to see? I think normalizing the call-out culture in a compassionate way. Normalizing the call-out culture yeah. in a compassionate way. Turn it. What do you mean by that? So, you know, we have um, casual racism, right? So people just casually make racist remarks, but we can also casually say like, hey, I think um, this is not right. And it's okay for you to call out instead of being scared that you are overly sensitive. So call out in a, in a sort of in a positive, productive way instead of yes. a negative, violent way. Yep. Don't add to the violence. Yes. Increase the peace. Yes. All right. Okay. Zoe, what's one thing that you'd like to see done? Personally, I believe that education is the key in, cha in changing people's mindsets. So definitely, I would like to see the younger generation, like say maybe prim the primary students being educated more on this. And also, I think that I agree that maybe the younger generation could actually teach the older older generation because usually it's been the older generation teaching the younger generation and I think it's an interesting uh, What would you like to teach the older generation specifically? I think that mostly it's not I personally I would like to open their eyes and think that actually well to be you know race blind isn't actually so bad because we we are all have we are all of different races and that we should all learn to live together in harmony and that well we shouldn't discriminate okay so candace one one thing that you'd like to see turned into action that you'd like to do to take us forward in this dis discussion so i think like so far a lot of people has talked about like raising awareness and like education but i think another important thing would be to have like more interaction between like different races because i think if we kind of be more open to talking about race because it's so sensitive but if we be more open to talking about it then perhaps we can understand like different races better and we can kind of like um become closer to other races as well. Do you think we'll ever get to a post-racial state, race blind state? Um, I think that it would take a very long time because after all, um, because like after all, as you can see like in the news, there have been like a lot of racist like incidents happening so far. So I think if we want to reach that state, it would take a long time. But as long as we continue like educating the younger generation and also we kind of um, educate the older generation as well and kind of have more conversations with them and have more conversations with other races as well, then perhaps we can reach that state. 
Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Candice, Zoe, Shima, Sunny, and Praveen. Excellent insights and some very inspiring words, and especially to my guests as well who've joined us virtually, Dr. Nazri Barawi and uh, Dr. Daniel Goh, and previously Dr. Matthew Matthews as well. I'm Janal Puducherry. Regardless of race, will we ever get there? Probably not in my lifetime, but this is an aspiration that we have all pledged ourselves to as one people, and we can never stop trying.